Instant Ralston and regular Ralston. The hot whole wheat cereals in the red and white checkerboard packages present Space Patrol! High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! In today's transcribed Space Patrol adventure, Buzz and Happy are in the refrigeration control compartment of their spaceship on a flight to Venus. The air is rapidly leaking from their ship, and then they discover a giant worm clinging to the wall of the ship. Take this bar and knock it loose, Hat. Yes, sir. It, it won't come loose. It's as hard as metal. You're right. That's what it eats. Feeding on the endurium bulkhead. That's how the air is escaping. Oh, well, the rocket commander is eating clear through the hole. We'll suffocate. We'll return in just a moment to today's exciting space patrol adventure, The Iron Eaters of Planet X. Space patrollers, have you entered the sensational Name the Planet contest yet? Well, you better hurry. Time's going fast, and you don't want to be left out. So hurry up and go with Mom or Dad to your Weatherbird shoe store for your free coin album and contest entry blank. Right. The Weatherbird Shoe Man will give you a swell coin album with three super-colored space coins inside, plus the entry blank on which you write your name for Planet X. Yes, you just named that tremendous new planet 5,000 times bigger than Earth. And your name for Planet X can win you a giant rocket clubhouse on wheels or one of the 1,750 other big prizes. Now, just imagine, gang... A 35-foot-long, 10,000-pound rocket clubhouse on wheels with a big, honest-to-goodness motor truck to pull it. And inside the rocket clubhouse are built-in bunks, lockers, electric lights, cooking equipment, all sorts of things for real space patrol living for you and your pals. And don't forget, the space patroller who wins the rocket clubhouse will also win the big motor truck and $1,500 cash. But don't wait, gang. Get started now on winning the Rocket Clubhouse or one of the 1,750 other swell prizes. Hurry to your Weatherbird shoe store now and enter the Name the Planet contest today. And now, today's space football adventure, the Iron Eaters of Planet X. For weeks now, there has been no major crime along the space lanes. Days have passed since the Space Patrol ship has reported even so much as the sighting of spacecraft approaching or leaving Planet X. Patrol ships ordered in close to the giant planet have made swift, daring scanning flights over known installations and have returned with identical reports. No new or suspicious activity. But still, Commander Corey holds firmly to his policy of constant vigilance. And then one day, a patrol ship space upon to report that justifies the commander's alertness. In the central office on the planet Terra, Buzz hands a copy of the report. Chief of that. Atomic radiation trace suspected J14 planet X. Nuclear reactor in full operation. Two power radiation towers focused southeast and south. Well, that's why things have been so quiet, Happy. Bacarotti's in his own backyard cooking up trouble for that nuclear reactor. He can cook up plenty. I wonder what he's using it for. Take a look at this map of planet X. Those thin green lines show where Bacarotti's beaming the power from his reactor. One beam goes toward the biggest spaceship, and the other is aimed toward a mining region. See what that means? Oh, you can speed up production of spaceships and war materials. Exactly. Well, then we'd better put that reactor out of operation quick. Yeah, that part is fairly simple. A cosmic bomb would take care of that. But we have reason to believe that eight of the most brilliant nuclear scientists of the United States are back there. Captured by Baccarati, huh? Yes. Yeah. We didn't attempt to capture that guy by a land attack with a danger, huh? Oh, that's right. You sure got a stymied. Yeah, for the present. What we need is a way of creating a panic about the reactor. A panic that will completely disorganize Baccarati's men. And yet won't appear to be caused by the space destroyer. That's a big order. The man on Venus who may be able to help us. Actually, I asked psychology and the professor of Venus. He was unable to come to Terra because of his illness. So we're going to Venus. Oh, well, why couldn't you just... Why couldn't I space upon him? It's a matter I want to keep completely secret. You know, the Baccarati's spy is still around. He might intercept the space upon him. Right. Let's get over to the spaceport supply depot, huh? Oh, your appointment with uh, Bert Gant. Mm -hmm. He's the new civilian supervisor in the ship supply section. Just a courtesy call, but it might help him let him know that space patrol understand his problem. Well, he'll probably have plenty. The last man in that job couldn't take it after this trouble with Baccarati's mm -hmm. body. Bert Gant's a younger man, huh? Let's hope he's a capable man. A 
On the monster panel X, Prince Baccarati glares at a control panel. The chair in which he sits looks strangely out of place. Massive and gaudy, it looks more like the throne of an oriental potentate who ruled on Earth 15 centuries ago. Regally, Baccarati turns as his chief advisor, Dr. Malengro, enters the power room and bows before him. Good news, Your Highness. Two more power relay powers are in operation. At this rate, Your Excellency's castle will soon be lighted by your reactive plant thousands of miles away. That's not important right now. The power is for factories and mines. I must have spaceships, hundreds of them, enough to conquer Commander Corey's space patrol. Of course, Your Highness. But perhaps Corey won't be alive to witness your glorious victory over his ships. Oh, then our little presents from the Iron Mountain are on their way. Well on their way. They were routed to Terra by way of Neptune. By the time they reached Terra, they will look like a routine shipment of supplies. Oh, uh, the ships they are carried in, do they have adequate refrigeration? Yes, sire. Your agent on Terra has arranged every detail. Well, there must be no mistake. Our little surprise must be in Corey's ship the next time he blasts off. Oh, uh, the agent on Terra. Tell him to contact me by space phone. What's his name? Dent, Your Highness. Bert Dent. In an office of the Spaceport Supply Depot on Terra, Buzz Corey and Cadet Happy are having a friendly chat with the new civilian supervisor amid the murmur of a battery of auditing machines. Yeah, I'll be blasting off of Venus in a few hours. You'll be working closely with the supervisor of Venus City Spaceport. I'd like to have you come along and meet him. Go with me? Yes, I don't intend to be away long. But uh, I, I am just getting into the swing of things here. Uh, to leave now... I know how you feel, but from past experience, I know that first-hand knowledge of the situation on Venus will make your work much easier. Here. Commander, this is wonderful. I, I'd like nothing better. But the fact is, my doctor has cautioned me about space flight while I'm under treatment. Different. Nothing serious, I hope. A temporary condition. I had a minor operation a few weeks ago. Some other time, then. If that happened, I will get out of here now, Mr. Gant, and let you get back to work. Several hours later, in his private living quarters, Bert Gant tunes the space phone transmitter to a rarely used frequency, then puts on a scrambler circuit. Using a code name for even greater secrecy, he finally makes contact with a man who sits in a throne-like chair on a planet billions of miles away. And a reporting to your highness. Make a quick triangle. I don't want them getting a fix on your location. Oh, you back to that. Crates from Iron Mountain aboard? Yes, your highness. The refrigeration system will fail an hour after glass out. And then the contents of those crates will go to work. He'll never reach Venus. And what? Nearly two hours out of Terra, Commander Corey and Cadet Happy are working their way aft with the ship on automatic control. Happy, stripped to the waist and covered with grease, is wiping the perspiration from his forehead with the back of his hand. It's not just in supply compartment three, sir. The refrigeration's cutting out all over the ship. You're telling me. The hull is reflecting back quite a bit of the heat in the space, but pouring through the viewport. I thought I could fix it in a piece, but it's a lot more serious than a blown fuse or a stuck wheel. Well, let's take a look at the connections in the terminal box. Hey, the trouble might be in there, I think. That was both of them. Half any a wrench. Yes, sir. Let's see, I left it lying right there on the floor, and it will put rings around my head and call me Saturn. Look at this. You call that a wrench? It's the handle of it, or part of the handle. Don't tell me you broke an endurium wrench. Who, me? Let me see that. Yes, sir. This is going to be cut in a combo tail. I did cut a wrench. Uh, besides, there's nobody else aboard to cut it. I'll worry about it later. Get me a wrench out of the tool kit. Is that around here? Oh, yes, sir. I had it right over here. The tool kit's wrong. Hey, Commander, I know you think I'm space happy, but it's true. I lugged it in here and, and set it down. Somebody must be aboard. I stole it. Hey, we'd better stole it, Happy. Look down there. Are those the plastic handles or some of the tools? I think they're not. But, but they are, all right. I think they're right about a stowaway. And he made the reefer system talk out. Wait till I get my hands on him. Commander, what's that? Up there in the bulkhead. It looks like a big welt in the metal. Hey, Commander, it's moving. I think I saw it move. You're right. Crawling along like a, like a worm, a gigantic worm. Where did that thing come from? A worm as long as your arm. There's another one. Lower down on the other bulkhead. Mm. Hey, 
our stowaway brought them aboard to keep us interested while he wrecked the ship. No, I... These are the stories. Huh? Look at the metal ball pit. Fitted where they call. Say, that's in Burien. How could a worm make an impression on a sheet of Burien? Well, that's what they eat. What? That and other metal. That's what's happened to the pool. Pat, get that rod. Yes, sir. Here it is, sir. You can knock them off with that. <coughs> it's coming loose, sir. Yeah, now get the other one. Well, come on, Lisa. Stop talking. Wait, Hap. Lean close to it. Listen. Stevie. Stevie and a metal bucket. Got to shut this compartment off in a hurry before this thing eats a bigger hole. Yes, sir. Now, let's get forward and boost the oxygen supply. Commander, look. Out there in the corridor. There are dozens of them. All our air's escaping. We're too late. They've eaten through the hull. We'll return to Space Patrol in just a moment. You have 1,750 chances to win in the Name the Planet contest. Right, Space Patrollers. 1,750 chances to win a wonderful prize, like a swim bicycle, for example. 750 Swim Varsity Bicycles are being given away. Swim, a lightweight bike, plenty sharp looking, plenty rugged, with three speed gear shift and two wheel handbrakes. And listen, you have a thousand chances to win a beautiful Space Patrol wristwatch, or a super powered autosonic rifle, a streamlined outer space helmet, or a valuable Space Patrol emergency kit. And remember, every Space Patroller can get a free prize. Just have mom or dad go with you to your Weatherbird shoe store for your free space coin album. Now, inside it, you'll find your Name the Planet contest entry blank and free space coins. Terrific coins. Big as a half dollar with designs of planets on them in starlight silver. So good looking, you'll want to get more and build a real space coin collection. And here's how. Inside every new package of good hot Ralston, you'll find another swell space coin to add to your album. And on the outside of every new hot Ralston package, Directions for entering the contest in case there's no Weatherbird shoe store near you. Look for the package with a picture of the commander or cadet happy on the front. So go to your Weatherbird shoe store for your free coin album, get a package of good hot Walston with a free space coin, and enter the Name the Planet contest now. And now back to our space patrol adventure, the Iron Eaters of Planet X. While Buzz and Happy are on a trip to Venus, their refrigeration system fails. The interior of the spaceship rapidly becomes stifling because of the sun's heat absorbed by the hull. As they attempt to locate the cause of the trouble in their ship's cooling system, they discover two enormous worm-like creatures literally feeding on the endurium bulkhead of the ship. They seal off that compartment but find dozens more of the metal-devouring worms in the corridor. Now, with air rapidly escaping into space, they stagger toward the forward end of the ship, gasping for breath. Seal off this section, half. Help me with the door. Yes, sir. There's another worm on the bulkhead over your head. Here's the spacesuit locker. We better get into our spacesuit before that one eats through the hole. Here, half, get into it, quick. Yes, sir. The worm dropped to the deck. Hey, look at that hole. All the air will be gone before we can get our suits on. I'll press my spacesuit right against the hole. That'll stop the leak till you get into your suit. Then you do the same for me. Yes, sir. Fighting against blacking out from lack of oxygen, Happy struggles into his spacesuit. Then, revived by the air supply within the suit, he holds his gloved hand over the hole in the ship while Buzz dons his suit. A few moments later, Buzz is at the controls of the ship, correcting their vector toward Venus. Happy returns from an inspection back at, smiling through the base plate of the spacesuit. Commander, I got great news. What do you think? The worms are all dead. Uh, we can seal up the holes in the ship, cut on the air supply. All right, Hap. We'll seal up the holes, but we'll keep the air turned off. Just before entering the Venus atmosphere. Yes, sir. But why? For two reasons. No air in the ship. The interior is now as cold as outer space. That's a bonus with our refrigeration system out of order. Yes, sir. Uh, but what's the second reason? The worms. How do you know they're dead? Well, they died when the air left the ship. Perhaps it was the cold that affected them. To make the ship warm again by bringing air up to normal pressure, they might thaw out. Keep it cold. Uh, but, sir, what makes you think it's low temperature rather than lack of air that stopped? Well, it may be a coincidence. But isn't it strange that we should have this mysterious trouble with our cooling system on the very same trip that those weird, meth-eating monsters show up? 
How? How did they get aboard the ship? What did happen to our complete system? The quick register on our electronic trouble indicator. Did you think they were already frozen when they were put aboard? Someone planned the failure of our refrigeration system to revive the world. Who could have done it? We might have a clue after Professor Erskine examines these creatures. Professor Erskine, from Venus University. He's an authority on planetary zoology. He can examine the worms while I'm at the hospital talking to Professor Fulow. Hours later, Happy sits in an office at Venus City Space Patrol Headquarters, anxiously awaiting the commander's return from his conference with Professor Bullo, the expert on mass psychology. At last, the door opens. Did the professor come up with an idea? Uh, can he tell us how to disorganize the reactor plant? We can't expect miracles, Happy. Before he can come up with a practical plan, he's got to know about conditions on planet X. Better luck with the other professor, though. The zoologist. Well, will you talk to him, too? Yes. Professor Erskine examined our metal eating pets. We had to dissect them with an atomo torch. I'm not surprised. The systems are designed to transform metallic substances into nourishing chemical compounds. They're not like the living creatures we're familiar with. They aren't dependent on plants to transform minerals into food. Are any of the worms still alive? Yes, they revived. They're safely sealed in old-fashioned wooden boxes. They won't eat anything that was once alive in the sense that we know. No meat, fish, plants, or trees. Uh, uh, just nice, juicy, endurium wrinkles and tender spaceships. The <laughs> professor is sure their basic food is iron oil. We lifted with a magnet. But where do they come from? He doesn't know. He refuses even the guess. Hmm. Well, if he doesn't know, who does? Either. The professor eliminated all the planets but one. Planet X. Right. But, but how did they get in the ship? Who put them there? We're blasting off the terror immediately, Happy. There's someone there I want to talk to. Someone I think can answer them. Meantime, in Prince Baccarati's castle, his highness is receiving an urgent spaceable message from Terra. Unscrambled, a frantic voice is earnestly pleading. Something went wrong, Your Highness. Corey is still alive. He's coming back to Terra. I've already heard the news triangle from my agent on Venus. You question me. He probably suspects me as it is. If he gives you a bradograph test, he'll know everything. You've got to protect him. Ah, don't worry. Corey will never question you. I'll order one of my other agents on Terra to take care of you. His name is Brugger. Now, don't worry. Thank you. Thank you. Mark out. Yes. Brugger will take good care of Bird Gang. The incompetent bundler. Back on Terra in his private quarters, Bert Gant paces the floor nervously. In a corner is a bag packed with a few belongings. At the sound of footsteps outside his room, he stops pacing, eyes staring wildly at the door. And then... Who is it? Over there. Over there. Wonderful. I've been worried. My bags are all packed. I'm ready to go. Put it down, Gant. You aren't going anywhere. But, but his highness said you would take care of me. That's right. You're this. No. No, don't, don't shoot me. This is all a mistake. Yeah. You made it. His highness doesn't like bundles. Uh, there are other people in the building. They'll hear the gun. It's silent. Now lie down so you won't run. No. No, no Ruger, please. Drop it, Ruger. Huh? I said drop it. Just in time. Came just in time. You know what he was going to do. Yes, I know, and I know why he was going to do it. What do you mean? Don't play innocent now. You supervised the loading of my ship. You saw to it that those metal eating worms were loaded into the refrigeration compartment, the metal boxes. Really, I. I you fixed the solenoids and the magnetic heating exchange pump so they pumped out. As the ship warmed up inside, the worms thawed and ate their way out. I didn't do it. Honestly, Commander. You had it done then, Bakarati's orders. That's why you were afraid to come to Venus with me. You never had a minor operation. I had your record, sir. I had to do it. Baccarati had something on me. Something that happened years ago. If it had come out, I could never have held a good job with the government. So you help a man who's trying to destroy the government you work for. That's great logic, sir. I give it to be straight and fast. You know, hey, those worms came from Planet X, didn't they? Yes. Where on Planet X? From the Iron Mountain. It has a high percentage of iron ore. The worms are thick on it, and then... It's like an atom. X is a big planet. There is our map. In sector L-15, about a hundred miles east of the Colossus River. Happy. Yes, sir. You see that Gant and Bridger are locked up. And the blast off the planet X. First, we'll pick up some fishing tackle. Fishing tackle? Yes, several tons of steel netting. That's 
Get them, fellas, ahead. Many hours later, the Terra 5 soars over the surface of gigantic planet X. No enemy ship challenged them because Baccarati's warning system, destroyed by Buzzinati on a previous foray, is still virtually useless. Mile after mile of the vast planet rolls under them. And then finally, a barren peak looms flatly ahead against the setting sun. That must be Iron Mountain, sir. It's checked with the grid coordinates. Notice it's not a growing thing for hundreds of miles, not even a weed. And that leading worms have this area all to themselves. They can have it. All right, Hatton, we'll cut our velocity and get ready to land at the base of the mountain. Open the bomb bay. Bomb bay open, sir. Lower the net. Cut on the cargo winch. <laughs> That's enough. Now, when we land, a tangle of steel netting will be stretched out on the ground several feet behind the ship. Stand by to cut rockets. Standing by. Cut rockets. Full repeller, Ray. What's to keep him from attacking the ship? The repeller, Ray. A half unit ought to keep him away. It won't lift the ship. I'm worried about the cables holding the net to the ship. Those are steel, too. They're covered with thick plastic. It's organic material, not mineral. The worms won't touch those cables. Man, they're crawling to the net already. It's almost as though they could smell it. We'll wait till they get a good haul, then they'll blast off. Within a few minutes, the heavy steel net is a mass of giant crawling creatures, eagerly devouring what to them is a rare delicacy. Finally, Buzz turns to happen. You'll blast off now before they do much damage to the net. Cut on the rear magnetic beam. That'll hold them to the net. And also keep chewed up pieces of the net from falling. Yes, sir. We'll rise up several feet with the repeller ray hat so the rocket blast won't ruin our dinner party. Fire rockets. Cut repeller ray. They'll go up several miles where it's good and cold. That'll put the worms quietly to sleep the way it did in our ship. I don't think we've lost any of them, sir. We'll keep our velocity down fairly low so the net won't trail back into the rocket blast. And that means we won't reach the reactor plant until long after dark. That's fine. But Roddy's men won't be able to identify the ship. When it flies over and nothing happens, they'll assume it's a Planet X ship. High above Planet X, the Terra 5, with its strange cargo dangling beneath it, roars toward the nuclear reactor plant through the utter blackness. Then through the infrared viewscope, Happy sights two tall metal towers rising several hundred yards from a group of massive buildings. There it is, sir. I'm going to fly as close to those towers as I can so the net won't have to fall far. Professor Erskine assures me that the worms are practically indestructible and have absolutely no sense of pain. Well, I'm going to make it as easy as possible. The net's just a few feet off the ground, sir. All right, Hap. I'm going to fire nose rockets and apply to the color ray. In a couple of seconds, we'll be hovering right next to the towers. Be ready to release the net. Yes, sir. Cut it loose. All clear, sir. Let's get away from here. And so, with a burst of speed, the spaceship leaves the reactor plant far behind. Then, using the row of hills to the east as a shield, returns and lands to late developments. If the ship has alarmed the personnel at the reactor plant, there is no sign. Hours pass. Then, in the dim light of dawn, black lumps on the ground begin to move. The chill of outer space is leaving their bodies, and they awake. They munch contentedly on strands of the steel net, as though it were soft spaghetti. Soon, the net is gone, and they crawl toward the Endorian towers. There is no hurry, no greedy scrambling. There is food for all, hunger. The towers continue to radiate their tremendous invisible energy across Planet X. And in the glowing light on top of the hill, Buzz and Happy watch. Then suddenly, Happy exclaims, Wow, see that flash of light? The worms from not a cross space from one of the towers it fell and cut through a heavy power line from the generator. Hey, the crew is coming out of the buildings now. Yeah, screaming out. Hey, look at them scattered. And no wonder the towers are buckling. The men are in no danger, but they don't know it. There go the towers. <laughs> Mob doesn't know what to make of it. But, sir, a few of them are running toward the field. They must have seen us. Yes, so did the rest of them. They're heading the other way toward the river. Scared to death, I guess. Happy. How many men do you count running toward the hill? Well, let's see. 
Hey, that's what I done. Those are the men we came for, Happy. The atomic expert, Pacuati, abducted. Let's go down and meet them, Happy. Yes, sir. You know, Commander, I've always heard that a worm turns, but I never expected to see a worm do anybody a good turn. <laughs> that's my ship, that. <laughs> An action preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure in just a moment. Space Patrollers, this is Commander Corey. I don't want you to miss the opportunity to win the giant rocket clubhouse or one of the other big prizes. You'll have to hurry. Go with Mother or Dad to the Weatherbird Shoe Store for your free Space Coin album and contest entry blank. The Weatherbird man has run out of albums. Ask him to get you one. Then you get a package of hot wall with the free Space Coin inside. Remember... To your Weatherbird shoe dealer, get some hot Walston and enter the Name the Planet contest today. And now, a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure. Buzz and Happy are in a scientist's laboratory on the planet Venus, bound hand and foot by Prince Baccarati. As they struggle to free themselves, a vacuum pump steadily draws air from a chamber containing a powerful chemical. Keep struggling, Happy. Got to cut off that pump before the chemical explodes. Before it is digging into my wrist. How much time have we got? It'll blow up when the indicator reaches 100 of an atmosphere pressure. 100? Smoke and rockets is almost dead right now. The ropes are so tight I can hardly move. Be sure to join us again next week for the thrilling story, Cyclone in Outer Space, when Instant Wilson and Regular Wilson again present Space Patrol! <laughs> Space Patrol, created by Mike Moser, starring Ed Kemmerer as Commander Corey, and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston, produced and directed by Larry Robertson, executive producer Mike Devery. Other players were Bela Kovach, Ken Mayer, and Norman Jolly. Dick Tufel speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Instant Ralston and regular Ralston again present Space Patrol! This is Dick Tufeld in St. Louis, reporting on the twin jet Air Force fighter, the McDonnell Voodoo XF-88A. In a moment, we'll hear from the noted test pilot who flies this plane, Phil Houghton. Speed of the Voodoo is a military secret, but it's plenty fast. Wingspan is 40 feet, length 55, weight 10 tons. And now, Phil Houghton, reported this morning at Lambert Airfield. After seeing the Voodoo, I guess you know why I like my job. There's one thing about it, though. The test pilot has to stay in good condition, get lots of sleep, and eat good, healthy food. That's why I like rice checks and wheat checks for breakfast. They've got plenty of energy in them, and they really taste well. I think you'll like them, too. No other cereal, puff or flake, contains so much nourishment in such concentrated bite-sized form. Do as Phil Houghton, J. Ray Donahue, Jr., and other top test pilots do. Make your cereal rice checks and wheat checks. <laughs> Be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol program on your local ABC television station. Consult your local paper for time and channel. This program is broadcast to our armed forces overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Space Patrol came to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. <laughs>